Um, just, just is everyone here? Are we all are we all present? Okay. So good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the second interaction in our online show. I'm so happy to have you all here with me um, to talk about your work. Um, I'm very excited about this conversation. I can promise it's going to be a great one. Um, I, yeah, so I think, I think the first, first order is to hand it over to our wonderful artists to introduce themselves. Um, we can start, we can start with Ranji. Uh, um, hi, I'm Ranji, and uh, this year, last year, I made a body of work titled Ikrina, which was a photo book and a portrait series. Oh, it was about um, identity and family, and how um, the how my family has formed identity throughout. I mean, the past five generations, basically. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna go according to the people that I see in order on, on my screen. Uh, Gemma? Hi, I'm Gemma Carrison, and my body of work was also a photo book, um, and it was titled The World He Built for Me to Live In. It's the non-linear narrative of my family's recent history, my brother's gender transition, and how that changed my family's dynamic and our process of understanding. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gemma. Uh, Robin? Hi, um, my name is Robin Taylor. Um, my body of work is titled Knit Me Whole Again. It was a sculptural piece and it's about domestic violence and overcoming trauma and yeah, and paying tribute to the victims of domestic violence. Thank you. Uh, you, Lynn? Hi everyone, my name is Yulin. Um, my body of work is titles. I can create a world as far as I can create this dish. So the work consists of photographs, um, video arts, as well as uh, 3D collages with books. <laughs> um, my work is basically about um, shifting identity and discovering um, the family lineage through food, food as well as um, uh, describing uh, first-generation Chinese immigrants and how we shape our own identity around the site of our home. Thank you. Uh, Faye? Hi, my name is Faye and my work is titled Inga Bayam. And it talks about, um, I look into the hidden histories and knowledge within my family and my lineage. And I basically do that through um, photography and sculpture. Um, you seem to have, oh, Yun Yong is back. Okay. Uh, uh, Yun Um, Hi, Yun I'm Yun Yang, and my body of work is called A Call to Home. Um, they're just uh, an exploration of questions that I never thought to ask. Yo, this internet. Hello. Oh. Oh dear. Um, we seem to have lost a member of our of our group. Um, I'm sure she'll be back though very shortly, and she can introduce herself. Um, in the meanwhile, the way that um, we're going to be chatting is. Oh, back. Ish, guys, I'm so sorry. This internet situation. 
Um, hi everyone, I'm Yun Young An and my body of work is titled Ko Yang, um, a call to home and questions I never thought to ask. So Ko Yang means um, hometown in Korean and my work is just an exploration of questions to identity and family um, ties and stuff like that, so, yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear what you guys are thinking about and making, and yeah, I'm sure you have so much to say about this. Um, so the way that this conversation is going to work, um, it's gonna be divided into seven different themes and topics that relate to family and history and these artists' work. Um, and then we'll, we'll close off. So the first topic is um, just in general making work under the pandemic last year, under COVID. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> Did... Did anyone want to speak about this? Like kick us off. <laughs> so um, we, we started our year off at the beginning of last year um, in studios, meeting with our supervisors, uh, starting our projects. And well, COVID hit. This is a story that everyone knows. Uh, and we suddenly have to find studios wherever we were. and. Uh, make things work uh, without the resources that we had planned to use. Um, for myself, I was in a very fortunate position being photography based and um, owning my own camera. Uh, and the topic of my work was my family. So at the beginning of last year when, well, almost exactly a year ago, I think, uh, when quarantine started, I moved to my family home moved back in with my family, um, not only because of COVID, <laughs> but uh, it was quite a shift. And I was able to carry on taking photos because I used my family as my concept, my springboard um, for my project. <laughs> so I was in a very fortunate position. I know others had to really rethink what they were going to make. <laughs> Very, very true. Uh, the pandemic has certainly affected all of us um, in different ways, I guess. Uh, all right. So it seems no one else wants to speak on the pandemic. Um, so the second topic is um, culture and family ties and feeling like one has a responsibility Um, I mean, for me personally, um, in terms of uh, the pandemic, my project changed entirely from what I was initially um, planning on doing. Um, and then it became more geared towards my family and um, the archives that were there because they've been there like my entire life. And that was basically the source material that I had. Um, so it like, was very beneficial to my research. Um, in terms of feeling a sense of responsibility, um, I think that for me as someone who has grown up in a, a lot of uh, white spaces, speaking primarily English, um, I felt that it was important for me to uh, reacquaint myself with this knowledge of the closer language and closer culture that I should know as a second language, but like I didn't. Um, so I felt a, a huge responsibility to represent it in a way that was respectful and represent it in a way that sought knowledge rather than just um, speaking on what I thought I knew. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Ranji. Um, just to jump off from what Ranji said, and also for the topics, there are going to be seven topics tonight, and 
Um, Sinead, if you could just read all seven, just so that people have like a general idea of the topics we're going to speak on tonight. It'd be really great. Okay, I can do that. Um, okay, so we, we already spoke about making work under the pandemic, under COVID. Um, the second topic that we're on now is culture, family ties, um, feeling, feeling that or feeling of having to take responsibility. Um, the third one is language and the language of violence and oppression. Um, fourth is femininity. The fifth is site specific work. The sixth is a medium or choice of presentation or process. Um, and the last one is colonialism, trauma and imperialism. So that's that's where we're going. Um, just to jump off from what Ranji said, uh, yeah, with and also from what Gemma said, COVID just shifted everyone's um, life perspective, ways of uh, movement. And I had to go back to Korea because I didn't really have a place to stay here. And I went back and stayed at my grandfather's place. Um, which my grandfather was the kind of beginning of me understanding my history, my heritage and why things were the way things were because he's a North Korean um, defector and a refugee, he was, passed away. And this was the first summer that I went there and the whole apartment was empty. So I was just staying in my grandfather's, my dead grandfather's empty apartment um, and yeah, it was uh, with responsibilities. His also, I don't know if I'm my my linear thinking is not great, but um, in the sense of family ties, this is a very it's it's a it's something difficult to connect to because of there's this language barrier, and there were. It's like a barrier of trauma that you would want to ask your grandparents about these stories of how things happened or what things happened. But because of trauma, your grandparents don't want to talk about these things. And so you don't have access to this kind of information that um, some other kids would be able to talk about and like having milk and cookies by the fire with their grandparents. But I, um, one thing with my grandfather, although he never was verbal about the kind of ways he loved my brother and I and my family. He um, always had raspberries ready for us in the summer. Um, and I, and that's the reason why I love raspberries because even though he wouldn't say things like, I love you or um, that he cared about us. And he was really mean actually, but every summer he had raspberries sprinkled with sugar um, that he went to the mountains to go pick himself ready for my brother and I. And his kind of story is what began my curiosity to my own history and understanding my context and where I come from. And Ranji has a hand. Um, I was gonna say, um, just uh, jumping off of what you said about, about what Yun Yang said, um, about understanding your grandparents um, now at this age, um, after they've already passed away, that I think is an interesting thing that I also had to um, contend with because I didn't necessarily think that I had much to learn from my grandparents, um, especially since they're no longer here. Um, but through like looking at the archives and, and looking at um, what they had left behind, this practice that they had left behind, there was a lot that kind of grounded me and like rooted me in an identity which I think was very important for my body of work in particular but yeah that's all I had to say all right um kind of just um basing on what you no know, Gemma and uh Union as well as Ranji said it, it's very interesting because um Union went back to Korea and had this connection um, with her grandfather during the pandemic and during um, the lockdown and everything. 
where I had the connection right before the pandemic. So when pandemic started in China, um, it was just started for a little bit and then I had to come back. But before that, I had the, the chance to really talk to my grandmother and being away from my grandparents after living with them um, for majority of my childhood was extremely hard because I used to speak dialects with them. So in my work, I, I kind of found this connection with my family through so my grandparents, through going back and talking to, to, to them. Um, it's a pity that my grandfather passed away years ago, but I, I was able to learn more about him through talking to my grandmother when I was back in China. And that really represented my body of work where I learned a lot from, um, you know, family, from learning, um, tracing back to what has already happened to me, but I kind of lost it um, in the process of growing up. So it was more of like a healing type of work for me. And I feel like for majority of us that has conceptualized our work around family, it is like a healing journey for every single one of us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Just to quickly jump off of Elaine's thing, um, with family, the whole, like, for me, um, my title being Kohyang, meaning um, hometown, calling back to home, being able to talk about family or understanding um, family in the medium of food for me was, an, was a way that I could connect to this home, to this family that I don't have full connection to because of barrier of language or culture or distance. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, oh. um, I wanted to say, um, bouncing off of pretty much what everyone has said, with my project, um, felt, sorry, with my project, I felt a sense of responsibility within the way that I approach. I'm talking about such sensitive topics within my family, um, especially the fact that uh, I've always connected more with my mother's side of the family because that's the side I've just always been exposed to. And when I work um, and dig into that, that's where I feel drawn to spiritually and culturally in all ways um, that I, yeah, because I've been able to just tap into that a lot more. So I felt a sense of responsibility to kind of, because I wanted to also tap into my father's side, it became a little bit of a difficult situation because it's almost like I felt like I wanted to protect everyone's kind of feelings around what I was trying to do. I didn't want to come across as I'm being selfish, but also seeing that through this process of uncovering um, the hidden knowledges, this hidden knowledge and history, I also just kind of felt like it is important to have these conversations and it is important to have these difficult um, moments mm -hmm. with people around us and also just being sensitive to the fact that it is something that might affect and expose everyone. So mm -hmm. that's what I dealt with within my project. I think uh, there's something very interesting about uh, what Faith is saying about um, the communication aspect because there's so much that you can like get from just talking to your relatives, like going beyond that barrier of like respecting, okay, this is an uncle, I must approach yes. very, very sensitively. But there's so much that can come from like just asking questions that you don't, that you previously didn't think that you could ask. And in some situations, I, I kind of eavesdropped <laughs> and I got like, it, I don't know, it was just um, a very interesting thing to kind of understand that I did have access to these things I just could have asked and they were very open to like communicating and also yeah and also through the language of Tosa engaging with the language of Tosa through their communication was just like it was incredibly interesting for me yeah and with the whole language of Tosa and also just dealing with 
um, knowing that, okay, there's a, there, there are boundaries, like when you're talking to your elders or whoever um, you're talking to, you just need to also understand that, okay, I am a child. There's certain things that I need to kind of be careful when I'm pushing a certain wall or I'm trying to pry or get something out of someone. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I agree. Mm. I think I have, um, with what Faith was saying about a sort of responsibility and not wanting to hurt people's feelings, um, I had to grapple with that in my project as well, because it was not only about my family, but a quite critical, in order to be truthful, I had to be quite critical of my family, including myself, which was fun. Um, and I sort of had to do away with the responsibility to present them in a nice, way you know I was photographing my mother um, and my grandmother would come over and look at the photos and be like you can't show people that <laughs> she thought that you know that's terrible that's private but a uh, big part of my project was seeing what what responsibility I had for myself um, and being maybe a bit selfish um, I've been well a responsible figure in my family and it was important for me to do away with that for a minute <laughs> to work on my project <laughs> connecting from what Jamma was saying of this like how would my family react to this to what my project is i didn't send my parents my grad stuff like until like a month later just just so I could like process and I don't know because I talk a lot about like different spiritualities or things like that that my parents might look at and they're like mm, you grew up in a Christian household like what is this what are you, what are you doing <laughs> what's going on um so yeah I, I hear you about what you're saying with uh, family and how they would possibly react um but at the end of the day it's this story that needs to be told from our perspective mm -hmm. yeah All right, um, so the next topic that we have um, is language. Um, we have a lot of multilingual people here tonight with us, mm -hmm. we're very privileged. Um, and I think uh, it's a very interesting topic and part of that is also the language of violence and oppression. Um, language is a very interesting one, um, or I don't know, it's just a, something I thought about a lot, um, because at home I speak mainly, I mean, I speak English to my sisters, and then I speak um, English and Kosa to my mom, um, and Kosa sort of just becomes a supporting thing, like when we're joking or when we are communicating with our relatives in Ginsburg. Um, so... The, I mean, titling my things in Kosa, I had to ask what certain things meant and I had to even Google Translate, but then sometimes the Google Translate ones were a bit like, I don't know, what is this? But like, <laughs> um, yeah, it was just a very, um, it was a process of trying to understand things that I didn't previously understand. And it was a process of sort of, of trying to like gather up that last archive of a language that I should have learned or well I do know Tosa it's, it's, it's my second language but I don't know it as well as I should um so it was a process of trying to rectify that for me yeah I can relate to um Ranji I grew up in okay my parents are from the Eastern Cape so at home we all speak is Tosa and that's my first language well, it should be, um, but I grew up in KZN and a lot of Zulu spoken there and also I went to English speaking schools. So I always feel a little bit of guilt feeling like is Tosa is my language, like why don't you know, like why don't you know it as you should? And with in tackling this project, it felt sometimes like I was, I didn't have the right to go and ask certain questions because it's like, yeah why are you asking such heavy stuff you don't even connect with us fully um 
via the language. So it became quite, I don't even think that that was the case, but my own guilt around the fact that I feel so detached from my language and my culture sometimes, it just makes me feel like I don't have the right to go and put myself within the circle of the people that I feel like are rightfully within the culture and still carry it um, the way that I would like to still be carrying it. Um, so yeah, language for me was something that I had to kind of just re, um, I didn't have to reevaluate, but I found myself in conflict with language a lot. It's a nerve wracking thing though. It's, it's, it's kind of nerve wracking because it's like, you should have studied, why haven't you studied? Like you've had 22 years to study and you haven't studied. So what, what, are, you, what are you doing? What have yeah. you been doing? You wasted time. And then when you're talking, because I know when I used to go visit my gran, I used to sometimes um, have to kind of prepare myself to go talk to her because I don't want to slip or, you know, not deliver um, within Isthosa. And that was kind of a lot for me. So it is, it was a lot. Yeah. Just briefly, um, the, I wasn't gonna say anything. <laughs> Uh, with the language stuff uh, and then tying also back to responsibility is this like if I because I didn't grow up in Korea like my understanding or my research is limited and the way that I may represent something might not even be fully that whole thing um, and in that sense responsibility of questioning myself like is it right for me to use this word or how can I use this word or which words can I use to describe this thing? And having to question that is like a, another layer in your process as you know, people who speak multiple languages, like how do we negotiate those kinds of barriers between these languages and how do you put that into one thing? Um, yeah, it's a very like confusing and difficult process, I feel. Mm -hmm for some uh, times but also difficult and that can also have you feeling like you're not capable of doing the project itself mm. but <laughs> you know so yeah yeah it's really relate or like you're telling a story that you're not supposed to be telling like faith was saying yeah by yeah. the way yeah yeah um which i, I think was sorry no sorry, sorry. it's fine go ahead um, oh, no, 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 no. oh, I guess with that being said, it's important then um, to approach things from a point of asking questions rather than um, mm. just presenting yourself as an authority on something. And I think that was something that I had, had to internalize very early on. Mm. Yeah, that's all I had to say. Um, I, I actually immigrated into South Africa when I was nine years old. So I had the, um, so when, before that I lived in China, I was raised by my grandparents. So I came from a very rural town and rural towns in China generally don't speak Mandarin very well. We speak dialect, which is, you can consider that a whole different language. It sounds completely different to Mandarin. And I was fluent in that when I was young until I came over here and my parents spoke Mandarin to me. And then because I was an immigrant child, um, every day they drilled into my head that I need to work really hard to study English. Otherwise I won't be able to do anything. I won't be able to pursue education. I won't be able to find a job. I need to be able to study English to survive. So I did that for years and years and when I reached to a point that I don't really know how to express myself in Mandarin or I don't even know how to speak the language that I used to speak which is the dialect I couldn't really communicate with my grandparents that well so it's kind of like what there there's some languages out there that just seem so that just seems so uh, important, important. 
um, and more important, more important than some others. And I don't think that kind of uh, shapes my identity well, because then I look back and I realize I've lost so many things that I already had, you know, and it, it's kind of difficult to grasp that and, and put myself in a beginner's shoe and re-study and re-evaluate and look at my past as well as the, the languages that I've been um, speaking. So it, it's really difficult for, you know, um, I, I can see that a lot of us maybe have had the struggle of not knowing if you're able to speak, not knowing if you're able to tell the story because you, you know deep down that maybe you don't know that much about it. Like that insecurity kind of creeps into you. Yeah. I can't really speak to um, having a language barrier and that kind of complication, but what you guys have been saying about having a story that you don't know whether it's yours to tell, I think that speaks to me because I essentially made a project about um, the identity of transgender, and um, but I managed to frame it because I do not identify with transgender. It's my brother's identity. Um, but I, I managed to frame it as rather, what is it, you know, the, I'm the narrator and my brother's the main character. Um, I know this is a bit off topic. <laughs> Uh, and to rather make the story about uh, being the sibling to someone who is transgender. So, and, and then of course the entire family dynamic. But it, it was something I had to grapple with and for a long time I didn't know whether I should tell it and I actually sat down with my brother and because I'm not doing sort of a general look at, you know, an entire culture or anything like that, it was very informative for me to talk to him and be like, okay, this is a project about his experience very specific um and that's how I sort of came to peace with <laughs> the story I was telling I think that language can definitely come in many different ways um I think that one doesn't you know one can have language language barriers between people who are speaking the same language so all comments are welcome <laughs> um <laughs> So um, the next topic that we're going to move on to is femininity, uh, because this is, as, as we are aware, an uh, all-female group tonight. <laughs> All right. I have quite a lot to say <laughs> about it. Femininity, it was a very big theme in my project about, you know, gender. Um, and uh, my project sort of started off, so at the beginning of last year, actually the same week that we went into lockdown, um, my mother had a breast cancer related surgery, a lumpectomy. Um, and so breasts were on my mind <laughs> and womanhood. And my brother had top surgery, which is the removal of breast uh, or gender reaff reaffirming surgery uh, at the end of 2018. Um, so there was this very interesting dynamic uh, that became a very prominent thing, this idea of a mother and her son and their breasts. Um, and what kind of gender dysphoria maybe circling in there. My brother's, it's very clear because he, it was part of a, a gender transition. But with my mother, you know, it was uh, the surgery and then uh, radiotherapy and then taking pills that are estrogen blockers. And this idea of what is womanhood? What is the feminine? It was all very much on my mind uh, when starting my project. Um, and then Another very interesting thing that I, I've touched on in my project is with my brother transitioning to being more masculine, 
people in our lives started to feminize me. I became the daughter, the only daughter, um, as opposed to part of a, a sibling pair. Um, and so then people started doing this very interesting thing where it was like, oh, okay, it's a, you know, birthday maybe. My brother gets the boy gift and I get the girl gift. I started being given pink things. This is the first time since Barbies, you know, <laughs> being a child. Um, and it, it definitely took me by surprise because I thought people wouldn't be quite so blatant in their gender stereotyping, <laughs> which is naive, I know. Um, I was already very aware that I was being cast in a, a sort of feminized role because I was out of the two siblings in my family, me and my brother, I was the responsible one, which is kind of code for motherly, which is kind of code for, mm, this is sexism. Um, you know, I would be the one that <laughs> does cooking, cleaning, caring, um, all the things that women should do. Uh, so my brother transitioning, <laughs> it was very interesting. He got a, a kind of another version of this, uh, rejection of feminism, sexism, which is someone, a family friend told him that now that he's a boy, he can't be unemployed, he has to get a job because it's all right if girls are unemployed because, you know, they'll find husbands, but boys can't be unemployed, boys can't be at home. <laughs> and I got, you need to know how to run a household, young lady, you know, <laughs> so, um, and my reaction to this, this feminizing that was happening, because firstly, I wouldn't call myself a girly girl. Like I, I don't actively look for pink things. It was very obvious when people started giving me pink things that this was a projection onto me. Um, and there was, uh, you know, some people hear me say this and they think, oh, well, you're, you're blaming your brother, your brother's transition. <laughs> Um, for people treating you like a girl, girl. Um, but it's not, it's absolutely other people's projection. You know, people also chose to treat him like they think a boy should be treated. Uh, yes, I feel like I'm derailing. I'm starting to <laughs> rant. <laughs> Does anyone want to jump in? <laughs> um your femininity age. So my, my work, um, I started off with masks as well. And the, the, the thing that started it off was this, this which is like a laughing mask. Um, and if you look at it in different angles, you can have, you can see different expressions. Um, and this one, the men's one has this wide mouth where you can, you have space to speak and everything. But if you look at the woman's one, which I don't have, um, the mouth is covered and there's just a small breathing hole. And actually in some of the masks, you don't even have a mouthpiece at all. Um, and I just, I looked at that and I said, I questioned it. And when I questioned it, my dad was like, why are you questioning such things? You know, why, like, it's just art things. You don't have to be so deep about that. Um, and I was like, no, it's, it's something also as an Asian woman where there's a stereotype that you must be timid. And I'm sure Yuling also has a lot to speak about this, but um, like as an Asian woman, you, you're timid, you're shy, you don't say things, you're not loud. Mm -hmm. And when I laugh out loud, my parents will always tell me to like, laugh with your hand in front of your mouth or don't laugh too loud. Um, and so, I hadn't even, yeah, with this. So this thing though, in the history of the masks, these are actually vessels in which the person donning this mask, it doesn't matter your gender. Um, it's just, can you embody the spirit of this mask, whether you are male or female or theys? Um, uh, yeah, and that's another part of my work that now I don't really remember what I was saying, but yeah, femininity is a, it's a big thing in, in this work and having to 
um, also navigate through the research, asking these questions and then being told things like, mm, those questions are not necessary questions that you should be asking. And then you have to like step back and be like, oh shoot, am I? And then you realize, no, I'm being gaslit right now. These are very important questions that as a female, someone who identifies as a woman, I, I should be asking and I have the right to ask. And I would like to create the platform so that other people can ask, um, like my cousins who in a family setting, if we're eating a meal together, they'll be quiet the whole time, but the boy is just running around and making all this noise. Um, and the women are in the kitchen cooking and cleaning and the men are on the couches looking at the TV. So things like, uh, yeah, my work, I feel, um, I, yeah, I want to be able to say my part, but really more than anything is so that um, other girls can look and say their part that they need to be, that needs to be said. Just with the with the cooking, it is very true that during family events, um, all the women and the girls are expected to be in the kitchen. Um, when I reach a certain age, um, my family would say, "Why aren't you helping in the kitchen?" Um, and I look at my boy cousins, which is watching TV with my dad and uncles. Um, it's it's never a good feeling because I I felt like um, I felt like I didn't want to do it because I'm a girl, but um, I had a talk with my mom um, about it um, actually. And it's very fortunate that I have, um, I was born in a family with very strong women, my, my grandmother, as well as my mom. Um, they have, because our, 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 our um, family come from quite a rural-ish town, we didn't really have very distinct cuisine. So relating to food, there were a lot of culture, like raw culture, um, non-documented culture um, revolving around it. So when I told my mom about it, she said that it's actually a nice experience for her that she was able to learn dishes from my grandmother. And she found that that was like a bonding session with her um, and my grandmother. And so I thought if I were to, if I want to understand my mom and really truly speak um, and tell her story, maybe I should, you know, um, maybe I should do what she was doing. That's why I imitated her cooking. And I, I um, throughout my work, I had a video artwork with her cooking and then I cook at the simultaneous time um, with the same dish, a dish that is um, not documented. I cannot find the recipe, but it is like a form of um, sort of bonding with my mom. And now I can really feel like I have the right. Also, that's also relating to the language. I feel like that's the language of movement. Um, just not really speaking, but just by moving together at the same pace, I can really understand it. So, I guess femininity in the sense it, it's I was talking about um, my family lineage, but on the female side, which is also something very interesting because, you know, like lineage and culture and surnames is generally derived from the male side, but it's really nice to be able to carry on something from the female. Um, so yeah, that was my approach. <laughs> Um, there was a point um, in my research where I sort of started to look at um, Tulsa masculinity and I guess how it related to me. Um, and because I mean, I have uh, four sisters. Um, I don't really have relationships with my brothers. Um, so the only people I could really ask about things relating to masculinity, well, there was really just one person and that was um, my cousin and so basically that whole investigation was about um, if I were a boy how would I relate to certain things in Tosa culture would I be more in touch with it or um, I mean that kind of thing uh, so when I asked him um, he immediately was like like there's certain things 
<laughs> he was like, there's certain things I can't tell you, like serious. Um, and I guess that to me, it was, it was frustrating because it was like, well, why can't I know these things? But at the same time, you have to approach things with sensitivity. Um, but as a girl child, um, there's certain knowledge that you don't have access to and you probably will never have access to it because of because it's culture and because out of respect you probably shouldn't even ask um but yeah that was something that sort of confronted me probably it was like probably around june last year so yeah that's what i'd say <laughs> uh, robin i think you're on mute you kind of, you said you wanted to speak on on this yeah so my project um dealing with domestic violence it is almost always actually gender-based violence so I think that's just when I first started working with this I thought you know I'd be fine you know this is what happened and let's deal with it but I actually found it quite tiring but I also found that it definitely opened up a dialogue between myself and my female friends. And I found that very empowering. And I definitely think it strengthened my work. Um, just, you know, realizing the constant threat that, you know, females are under every single day. And I just think bringing attention to that is a really important thing. and. I hope that, that my work did, yeah. Uh, Yunyong, did you want to say something or? Okay, okay, awesome. Um... All right, I think we can then move on to our fifth topic, which is site specificity um, and working, working in a particular place or maybe even working at home. Um, should I start? <laughs> Um, so my family is from Ginsburg in King Williamstown in the Eastern Cape. Um, I didn't grow up there, but all of my cousins still live there. And my uncles, my grandfather was living there um, when he passed away. And um, it, it basically formed a central part of this thing. Um, Ginsburg, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> um, Ginsburg is where we go is from Biko um, Black Consciousness um, and both of my parents are from there and sorry I lost track of what I was trying to say but basically me going to Ginsburg in September last year was very instrumental to this entire project because it essentially unearthed a lot more in terms of the archive and um, it gave it a lot of a sense of direction as well. Um, it actually changed the entire direction um, and gave it like the depth that it had. So yeah, that was site specificity for me. Site specificity for me, um, I felt it was a big part of my project because of the fact that my whole project is centered around kind of being in search of where I'm rooted, um, which um, links to the title of my work and feeling like I'm removed because of where I grew up in KZN, being from the Eastern Cape. So that back and forth and feeling like I'm lost somewhere in the middle um, became a big thing. And how I, how sight was important within my work is because of where I took most of my photographs um, was around my grandfather's, um, on my mom's side, his plot of land. So all over that area, I kind of took different photos 
um, which symbolized um, being on this constant seeking of where my roots are within his space. And one of my photographs is taken in front of his church that he and my, I think apparently my great grandfather built. Um, so that is also within conversation between um, spirituality and religion as well. Me being on an ancestral kind of seeking, being photographed in front of a church that he built, but also now he was a healer as well. It's just a lot of things that kind of come together and are juxtaposed um, within my project. Also, some photos were taken um, by the sea, and that's also another place that's kind of very um, significant in terms of being in search of spirit and the ocean is a big symbol of that for me. So yeah, that's, that was site's specific, specificity for me. Um, sorry, uh, just to, cause I lost track of what I was trying to say earlier. Um, but basically what I was trying to say is that Ginsburg, what is this is very is central to my project and it's because it's the, like the base, like the most basic brushing up of my lineage with against the history of South Africa, the grander narrative of colonialism and apartheid. Um, my family, of, or at least five generations of my family have um, lived in Ginsburg and Ginsburg is also this place where it, it was born out of colonialism, like all townships were, um, but it was like born out of colonialism, but then it also saw the dismantling of colonialism through black consciousness, because black consciousness, which um, mobilized students um, into the 80s and 90s. Um, so yeah, I guess that was the centrality of sight in my um, research. And it's exactly why I needed to actually go there and understand certain things about my own family in order to complete this project. Yeah. That's it. All right, no, no, you did green well. <laughs> right. um, Okay. So so on to a very interesting topic about materiality and medium, also just choice of choice of representation and also I guess the, the way that we make our work, the process of how we make our work. Are we on medium and process? Yeah, we're on medium. Yeah. 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 Um, just to start off, so with Sam as Yuling, um, food is, well, not same, but similar. Food is one of the biggest mediums that I use to um, present my work and my ideas. And I think the reason I started off with food is just because um, I love food, but <laughs> food is, I think, such uh, a great way of connecting to people without really having to say much. And I saw that firsthand with my grandfather where you know, he, he was never a person to sit down and tell you warmly that, oh, I love you so much, you know, but he was able to do that with a small bowl of raspberries with a bit of sugar sprinkled on top and consistently every summer. Um, and I think that's kind of the thing that opened up the, the trajectory of understanding food as a way of communicating with people. Um, and also with food being a medium, I think it's also a way to understand current reality of things, of how the world runs. Um, people, a lot of people say, you know, colonialism is a thing of a past, but no, it's a, it's a cultural and economic reality. And you can see that very much through the way food is, um, food is run, the way the food, what is it? Part of the food day. Uh, thingy, <laughs> the way shops are run, the way food commodity, commodification of food. 
Um, and that's where I started my whole thing with banana boxes and bananas and why a banana, bananas are an important part of my, um, of my work because in Korea, like a decade ago, a few decades, a decade or so, um, bananas were the most expensive, expensive fruit in Korea. Like a middle class family would buy one banana and split it for the whole family. Um, and that's how much of a luxury this banana was. But now, fast forward to now, there are bananas are just everywhere. You know, you go to um, the markets and you always have bananas. And I, I think it's an interesting thing now, I guess, with people being able to afford bananas now in Korea, um, they just want a plethora of it. Because if you come from a place of lack um, and then you suddenly have this, this availability that it's always there, it's gonna be like, you're gonna get more than you need. Um, and this is also a really interesting dynamic because in places like Central America where land is being used up and dried up to accommodate accommodate these banana plantations among like palm tree plantations and all of these things. Um, this kind of lifestyle is depleting um, and not only Korea, there's, you know, America, the United States, not America, sorry, the United States is a, a big one of, of this, this client that depletes the land. Um, and so it just kind of being able to trace uh, these kinds of stories and these narratives of uh, colonial realities through food is a really interesting way for me to understand history and um, also a way to understand my personal history because I can then trace my grandparents' stories and their grandparents before them through the medium of food. Um, and this is important to me because um, of things like war and trauma, I don't have the information to access, a, like knowledge to access my grandparents or my great grandparents' histories. I don't even know who my gra great grandparents are. Um, but through food, I can I can trace where they were and the possibilities of like what kind of people they, they might have been. And so I think food is, um, it provides that kind of platform to be able to do that research and understanding. Whew. I'm just jumping off of what uh, Yun Yang said. Um, my medium as well was a way for me to understand um, my own like history and um, yeah, history basically, because um, growing up, I think like we had like a, like a lot of books. We were a, like a family of readers. Um, and so like a book being a, a place where knowledge is found, it felt kind of um, apt to present my body of work through a book, um, a book that would then be added to the shelf, like added to the shelves where all these other books are. Um, and I think that that's important because we also have all these family albums, but I think that that's important um, for generations after me, for me, my sisters, my cousins, and for generations after us who want um, that knowledge of who our family were or like both, well, both sides of my family, um, who they were um, in the 20th century and who they are now in the 21st century. Um, so yeah, I basically, I think the photo book is very important in terms of documenting lived experience um, and keeping it there for people in the future to find and understand. Yeah, I also made a photo book. <laughs> I was thinking about it in maybe a bit of a different way, sort of um, I, before COVID and everything, I had this grand idea of what I wanted my final exhibition to look like. <laughs> because there's something so marvelous about walking into your own exhibition and being able to look around and say, I did this. <laughs> then when it was proposed to me by our supervisor that my work was going to live in a book <laughs> which is you know a, a quiet object um, until you interact with it 
I was quite worried. Uh, so I wanted to figure out a way that I could um, let the book speak by itself because I also felt that even though I was making work about family, I didn't want the intimacy of that topic to get in the way of the fact that societies are made out of family and furthermore politics. Um, I wanted my work to read as a socio-political work uh, and to take up space in a room I was very concerned about the photo book, um, but it works. It works perfectly, and I can't argue because what I was trying to do was make a story, tell a story, not a, a linear story in any way, uh, but a narrative. And what better form than a book? Uh, what I did manage to do with, um, in terms of materiality, with my own book is I made a concertina book, so the book actually unfolds. Uh, to about 17 meters in length um, and then I, I built a six meter long table for it to sit on in my exhibition exam for a day <laughs> um, and luckily there are wonderful photos that now live on the Michaelis website if you want to go look um, <laughs> so I could present it as almost a sculptural piece because I could unfold the book into this accordion-like structure and people could theoretically go and uh, page through sections of it. But I actually presented in my exhibition exam, which is the sort of ideal imagining of how I wanted my work to be viewed. Um, I presented two copies of my book, one in this unfolded form and one closed on a shelf for people to interact with in this intimate photo book-esque way. Um, to have a personal moment to make personal judgments on my work. Um, but it was, <laughs> it took a lot to get there, um, but I'm glad I did it. I sort of present the journey in two different formats because my book is a culmination of different points of view. Um, just, it's very interesting because I also use books but not in the form of photo books, but kind of in photo books. It's more because I discovered um, a pile of childhood uh, photographs that my parents bought over when they, when they immigrated. And it's just bizarre to me because why would, you, um, why would you take so many photos like across country? But they told me it was, a, it was a way for them to remember to kind of connect with people because cell phones weren't a thing. So they would have printed photographs um, they, they, that they keep so they can um, look and, and miss their family um, when they were here trying to establish a new life. So all those photos, I was very young. I had barely had any memories of, of myself taking those photos. And I thought it was a very interesting way if I could create um, a journey, a theatrical journey with photos in books. Um, and the books that I, I use lots of uh, cooking books because I wanted to archive my mom's recipe, but not in the form of an actual recipe, in a form of memory, as well as uh, the journey that my family has taken from immigration. So I've folded and collaged books into this very because books they normally are presented closed um my books was open on the wall and it kind of looks like um an installation a, a, a lantern of, of some sort and it, it it has its own story to it and it and each one of them connects with each, with each other because of um the reused old photos so, and also like going back to Union's food, how food also helped me to, to understand that is, is the, the recipe and the dish that my mom made. And that encouraged me how, that encouraged me to create this project um, using cooking cookbooks and um, recipe books. Um, I, I just found it very interesting how, even though we all sort of the idea of books, the idea of photos, um, we can present it in such different ways that tells different narratives. Mm. 
I think family albums as well are, are, are very important because um, I mean, for my parents, they started an album like in the 80s. I, my mom has basically kept it since the 80s and her father kept an album from when he got a camera, like probably in the 70s sometime. Um, but these photos, looking at them, I mean, it's obviously like of an ordinary family, but because you're looking at photos of an ordinary family, you can kind of separate them from the context. Like obviously the context was apartheid. Um, but in looking at these like carefree mundane photos, you're able to see them as people and not as people who are like living in this very fraught context. Um, so I, I don't know, I really admire family photographs for their ability to kind of, your, their ability to shift things, yeah. Um, for me, um my choice of medium i think i did two different um types of medium i did photography and sculpture and those were two that i well mostly photography i wasn't um it wasn't my initial plan to work in that way but because of covid i had to kind of um shift um and in the beginning of my kind of trying to get into how I'm now to make work. Um, I was going through this kind of transition within myself, um, just trying to kind of figure out certain things that I was experiencing. And like I've said in my work, I do work from dreams and also just trying to connect with the idea of memory and remembering, remembering in different ways in terms of going through archives and things like that and remembering through conversation. Um, also then the dreams did also serve as a kind of remembering. Um, and I used the weaving that I did within my work using um, wool on cardboard loom to kind of work in a way that is not so calculated. Um, so that for me was kind of a form of meditation and to kind of serve as a way to create a kind of space where I allow the remembering and the memory to kind of just filter through and not try and control it and not try and control the work that is coming from it. Um, and the photographs are important to me because they also serve as, because I don't, I didn't really have any archives to go back to and um, kind of look back at like my grandparents and my great grandparents. So for me, it was important to take photographs, especially around the home um, and within my grandfather's house, because for years from now, it will probably look different. I don't even know if it'll still be there. So that for me is important to kind of have that for future generations and just to know that that's there for, that I have access to it. And also using my body as a medium and that I've never done either. That was my first time kind of photographing myself. Um, I don't know why I did that because I hate taking pictures. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it happened. Um, and I think when I reflected on it, it was important for me to do that because when you are talking about work ancestrally, your body does become a medium itself. And there's a play on the word medium in terms of spiritually um, a person can be a medium and it can be a point of like divination and accessing memory through your body or through your mind or your spirit so that for me looking back I think I'm happy that I took photos using my body and the apron that I made I sewed it myself didn't know I could sew either so COVID really brought out some talents that I didn't know I had. <laughs> um, so yeah, sewing as well, that apron 
symbol of the different layers um, that I take on within my journey of discovery from, I look at it as a piece of like a, like a uniform or armor that I wear um, to kind of carry on the work that my great or my grandparents have done in the ways that they, um, how do I put this? I'm losing my chain of thought, but yeah, to the sewing of the apron and the layers and the length of it, I think also has its symbolism and it adds to my work in that way. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, Robin, I know that you wanted to speak about, yeah. Um, I think for me, medium was also obviously very important. Um, taking furniture, which, um, you know, signifies the home space and just like smashing it up into pieces, um, which ended up being actually quite fun. Um, yeah, it was very satisfying and having, I don't know, just breaking up something that, you know, resembles a home um, in a way it was very healing. And then to take all those broken pieces and um, put it all back together, you know, I think it shows like resilience and yeah, just to see the whole body of work at the end, to, um, I almost like recreated like this whole household, but everything was broken and wasn't, you know, there was no way of like perfectly fixing it. Um, I think that really speaks to domestic violence and the effects that it has on the victims because, you know, after you've gone through such an ordeal, you know, you can never, you know, it, it alters you um, and it definitely just shifts who you are as a person. And then introducing the wool um, that was just so gentle and feminine and like made with like love and patience and taking that and wrapping it around these dangerous like jagged objects it just the contrast between the two I found very interesting and I think it definitely like provided a lot of closure for myself um and also like Faith was saying, like using your body as a medium, um, bringing yourself into the project. Uh, I don't know, for me, that was really important. And it, it also makes you confront a lot of things, like seeing yourself in the work. Um, and often that's difficult. So I think it's also good to bring focus to that. Yeah, that's it. Um, just jumping off from what Faith and Robin were saying with body, um, I also did performance and this is also kind of like, I, I think it's going to be a question. Um, I, our bodies carry But our body reacts to these things in a certain way. And when it happens, it's like, oh, I, I didn't I didn't know that I could react in this certain way. And I, I guess I wanted to ask. Um, um, Yun Yang, you're, you're breaking up. Uh, I don't know if anyone else is struggling. Um, yeah, I, I am also, I can't really hear what you're saying. I also, I couldn't hear what she was saying. Okay. Um, I'm sure she'll join us in a minute. It sounded like she had a question and input for this particular topic. Um, yeah. Ah, there she is. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, body. So going back to body, um, 
I don't know where it cut off, but <laughs> guys, I was exiting from the beginning. I think. We okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so I was so thrown off. The whole Zoom like exited and it like went away. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but with body, uh, yeah, our body, like Faye said, it carries so much um, knowledge already that uh, we we have and we also didn't know that we had and I guess what and because I also did performance and I like have felt how it was when I spoke about these things or like I was embodying these things that I've been talking about in my project and put that into performance it's all of this like blood rushing through my body that I I didn't know I had so much energy um in in my in my body to express these things and so I also wanted to ask Faith and Robin like in using your body how did you feel like your energy shift or like were there these kinds of um, like Faith said you didn't know you had these things inside of you but now after accessing or activating these parts of your body that have been um, in with you doing a performance how was that process or how how did you feel your energy flow Um, for me, I think uh, I didn't really, well, because it was pictures, um, it wasn't like, okay, wait, okay, not the photography part, but within the weaving, um, I found a lot of, I don't know, what it is, a lot of healing came from it because I felt like that was the very first thing that I did. I didn't even think I would include it in my exhibition, um, but because it had so much, it played such a big role in me kind of tapping into the knowledge that I didn't know I had within me and feeling like I have no archives to look back um, to, I have nothing, but then through just listening to my body and just letting it provide and let the energy all the knowledge flow and create the work for itself. Um, that was the energy that I kind of felt come through the most. Um, with the sewing as well, um, a lot came from that because the apron itself, um, it presented itself to me because I had a dream of that apron in the way that it was. And it kind of didn't make sense to me to then go and create it. But the fact that it was presented to me and it just wouldn't go away, I was like, okay, I will make this apron. So I made the apron and through making it a lot of, I didn't know why I was creating it. It had no concept behind it at the time. And as I'm creating it, the knowledge and the information and things started flowing through me. I'd have questions that I'd even go ask my mom and I wouldn't know where they're coming from or why I'm asking certain things. Um, but then you realize that it's not necessarily coming from you or your mind. Um, mm -hmm. It's coming from a different place. So I think, yeah, I found a lot of healing through this project in that way. A place beyond ourselves. Yes. Mm. I think for me, um, it was also very healing. It like using my body in the performance. Um, it was very therapeutic. Um, if you see the pictures, the the wool that I was using was very very large, thick wool that I made, and I had to use my body and my arms to knit it so like my arms like became the knitting needles and it just it was like it was giving me power to like heal the situation or to to, to mend all those broken objects that resembled like violence and trauma and then it was just like you know it it gave me a sense of control and it, the whole process was very healing as well, I think. Yeah. Um, 
Very, very interesting discussions. Uh, so the last final topic is around colonialism, trauma, imperialism, and perhaps some spirituality linked to all of these, these topics, very heavy and important topics. Um, I guess to start off, Ooh, yeah, my, my specific one that I, I mean, coming to South Africa, I think, and seeing my first experience, one of my first most memorable experiences of it being in Cape Town when I first came was I was with um, a group of people, we were all POC, and we were crossing by a restaurant in Seapoint, I think, and inside the restaurant, there were all old, like white people, um, Caucasian people. And as we're walking by, it's as if the whole restaurant stopped, everyone stopped and looked at us and just stared at us, like walk, walking across the restaurant. And I was like, yo, what the, what the hell? Like, what is going on here? Um, and I think that kind of, it started my whole understanding of how I connect to, um, I don't know, being in South Africa is, I don't know how to word this, but um, it opened my, how to understand my connections to Um, it, is everyone else uh, hearing what Yun Yang is saying or? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm not here. Okay. Um, she seems to be frozen. Um, uh, such a pity she seemed like she was, she seems to be struggling with internet maybe. Um, does anyone else? want to talk about this while we wait for her to reconnect or maybe she'll reconnect soon um. ah there she is hello <laughs> <laughs> um i don't really know how to connect really everything i was trying to say i think i'm trying to say too much but um spirituality under the sense uh, under the lens of colonialism or imperialism has been very fractured um, and to understand this and when my title when I said my title was questions I never knew how to ask or never thought to ask um, is a part of my title I already said that um, was me asking these questions about my own spirituality and the roots of Korean spirituality, which I came here and I found so many similarities with um, indigenous healing here and indigenous healing in Korea that have both been very um, demonized and rejected and seen as a very primitive type of practice um, of spirituality where uh, you have not Christianity or um, Catholicism or um, Buddhism as these main things. and these these other spiritual practices are deemed not important, but actually these are these practices have um, they highlight the importance of one's connection to land and one's understanding of, of self and spirit and beyond the self as well. Um, and with American imperialism specifically is from my experience as a Korean missionary who ended up in Kenya um, and Korean spiritual, uh, Korean Christianity coming from American missionaries. And uh, yeah, this is, it's a very 
interesting spectrum to navigate and I still am trying to navigate. But what I can say is through my research, I've realized the, the depth of how violent um, imperialism and colonialism is uh, and how fractured it has left our under, my understanding of spirituality because I thought I could never ask these questions, especially as a, a pastor's daughter to ask questions about um, indigenous healing or shamanism is like, is taboo. Like, what are you talking about? Which is why I, I said in the beginning um, that I didn't want to send this to my parents because I knew they would question me um, about these things. So yeah, there's just a lot to still unpack and still that I'm unpacking and learning through these things. Uh, but yes, questions, just asking a lot of questions is my, is my MO these days in regards to imperialism, the way it has run society until now. I can, I can relate to what you're saying, Yin Yang. Um, in my family, Christianity um, is something that we grew up very, very like strong in. And um, my grandparents were also very big and dominant members within the church. Um, so was my great grandfather. So now with them not being with us anymore, I, well, in the beginning um, when I started feeling these questions come up, coming up within me and wanting to question certain things that I was experiencing um, spiritually and feeling the taboo to kind of ask certain questions and also feeling guilty because um, I didn't want to come off as disrespectful and challenging to the beliefs that we've had um, for the longest time and not knowing um, a lot about the history of um, sp spirituality within my family and not knowing that both sides actually do exist, the shamanic kind of healing and Christianity um, because the Christianity always has been the loudest. So for me, it was a challenge in the beginning. And then once conversations started happening within my family and once it started affecting everyone, um, I think that's when it was revealed that actually there are both of these sides that do exist. It's just that the other side is the one that was kind of more demonized and wasn't quite um, expressed freely. Um, so yeah, that's my take on it. And also to jump off from what you said with this one side being so loud, I found myself being fine, found myself feeling so angry. Um, and in, with things like the mask, um, where it comes from like an indigenous type of, because I said the spirit of the mask. So what kind of story are you telling? And then, you know, the female perspective, you can't say the story or in the, in the, in the, um, in the perspective of um, indigenous knowledge that you can't tell the story. And I found myself like feeling so angry, like I want to know the story, I want to tell the story, but I, number one, I don't have the complete access to it because of these, um, because of war, because of trauma, because of um, the, just the fracturing that this has left and to also the fracturing that things like colonialism has just like divided so much to that we can't, that you would have never seen this connection between two different people groups. I don't know what exactly I'm trying to say, um, but I was, yeah, like coming from what Faith was saying with this side being so loud, um, I found myself just feeling so angry, so, so angry about this fracturing that has happened and wanting to repair these bones that are fractured, but not knowing how to, not knowing where I'm gonna get the tools. Um, and yeah, and community as well is fractured because if we knew like that there are certain people who are thinking these things that people across the globe 
who are disenfranchised are thinking the same things, but we are divided, so divided that we can't connect to each other. Mm. Um, leaves me angry. Uh, and yeah. I think with that fracturing, uh, the thing that comes with that fracturing is um, that Western modernity and Western culture becomes a, the only thing that remains whole. And so like as, like as a South African, as a black woman, I feel like we constantly then have to position ourselves in relation to um, Western culture and Western modernity and all the things that it has caused in our own experiences. Um, and I think that's quite a difficult like thing to get stuck in, like this thing of now, like what am I supposed to do? Because I must now constantly consider myself in relation to whiteness, like just this construction of whiteness and Westernness. Um, and that I think is where my project came from because um, when I started, because my father wrote um, Miko a biography and in that book, he talks about um, hidden lineage, invisible lineages, um, which are all these um, stories, these stories that we don't know that kind of make up our understanding of the world and make up our experience um, and the way we move through the world and yeah. Um, and I think that hit me at because it was like, okay, so this is what I need to focus on because um, like, I think I found myself falling into that trap of constantly positioning myself in relation to whiteness and western culture uh that i yeah and so, sorry i've lost track of what i was trying to say but basically i think it was very important for me to see that lineages and the stories that go beyond colonialism are incredibly important in understanding where you fit in in the present day um because we i think we're at a point now where we know all the things that have happened, but we need to figure out what to do with it. Like we're just kids, we need to figure out like what to do with everything that's happened in the past. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's what my point was. I wanted to jump off something you said, but I completely like it. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think with the, what was from, I had a thought that was inspired by what you're saying is the, and back to family as well, that it has just this whole thing where you're trying to connect to um, information or familial ties that you can't. And yeah, I don't know what else can I go, where else can I go there, but uh, yeah. I think also <laughs> family is the only way you can connect to those things, like to right. where you actually come from. Right. right. Mm. To go off of like the end of what Ranji was saying of just, we're just kids and now we have to kind of figure it out now. And the whole thing around as having to then go to our elders to reconnect all of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's also feeling like it's a lot of pressure because we're running, it feels like we're running out of time as well. Yeah. So that's well, kind of yeah, that get stuck. It's very tricky. we're not hungry <laughs> um just just on a final note i think i think robin said she wanted to speak to this topic um no i didn't oh okay you didn't sorry you must misread, <laughs> mis misread sorry um all right so those are the those are the seven seven talking talking points for this meeting um i'm so glad we got to do this um, and I really thank all the all of our guests who have joined us either on this call or on, on watching us live on YouTube, even 
in posterity, maybe they watch next week, maybe they watch next year. Um, so we want to thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, I wish all of you good luck in your careers, good luck with this year. Um, yeah, so go and eat, go and have a good dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you guys did so well. Um, and I'm so proud of you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead, for managing our time for yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Well, well, I'm going to go eat. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> Give Trent a screenshot. <laughs>